what I'd like to do is welcome all of you to our uh, Center on Technology and Disability webinar, Adolescence Through Adulthood While Communicating. I'm Russ Holland. I'm, excuse me, the president of Adirondack Accessibility, and we are very pleased to be partners in the Center on Technology and Disability, and I'll be hosting the session for today. Uh, my main duty in hosting is to introduce a friend, colleague, Pat Orand. Pat and I had the good fortune to serve on the CSUN uh, advisory committee for a number of years together, and it gave me a chance to, to get to know her. And I've also been involved with uh, a number of presentations that she's done. I can tell you you're in for, uh, for, for a treat today. Uh, in addition to that, she has a master's degree in speech pathology from Loyola, Loyola College in Baltimore, master's degree in technology for special ed and rehab from Johns Hopkins, and she's president of Associated Speech and Language Services uh, Incorporated, uh, a practice specializing in augmented and alternative communication. Uh, over the years, as I mentioned, she's presented locally and nationally on a lot of different topics related to augmented communication. She has extensive experience working directly with individuals with significant cognitive, linguistic, sensory, or motor disability, excuse me, disabilities necessitating technology access. And she's done a good bit of writing on these topics as well. She's an adjunct faculty member at Johns Hopkins University School of Education, Department of Special Ed. She's licensed as a speech and language pathologist in the state of Maryland, a certified member of the Speech, Language, and Hearing Association, and past president of the United States Society for Augmented and Alternative Communication, USAC. And with all that, Pat, um, I'm thrilled that you were able to do this for us today, and I'll turn it over to you to get started. Well, thanks, Russ, and uh, thanks, everybody, who is here this afternoon. Um, those are kind words that you said, Russ, and I hope that uh, I keep you an honest man. Um, as you said, the topic that we will be discussing this afternoon is adolescence through adulthood while communicating. Um, and when, when, when you think about that, one of the things I thought was really worth noting and hopefully I will bring that out in some of the videos and the anecdotal information that we talk about this afternoon. Is very often what we're talking about is um, individuals who have congenital disabilities, well not very often, but always, they're either going to be an individual with a congenital disability, a disability from birth, or an individual with an acquired disability. And that means a lot. As we go through this session this afternoon, and we, we talk about how to identify optimal strategies and techniques for communicating across the lifespan, um, it's really going to be important to note. For example, um, is language intact? So um, we are going to listen for a second, watch and listen, a short video clip. Um, and this is a gentleman who has an acquired disability as an adult. And uh, it, it's Lou Gehrig's disease, a myotrophic lateral sclerosis. And I just want you to listen to Colin a little bit and talk about what communication means to him as a person who had intact language and speech up into um, his adult years. So, Nolan, if you wouldn't mind pulling that up for us. And while we're getting that pulled up, I'd just like to say to anyone in the audience, please feel free to um, raise your hand and I will call your name -E or to webcast make series. a comment. -E this is a talk series. that was presented by Colin on October 18, 2006 at the Oregon Health and Science University. And we wish to thank Melanie Friedoken and her colleagues for video recording this presentation so that it can be offered as a webcast. Now, here is Colin with NAAC User's Perspective. Thank you, Dr. Friedoken. Thank you, Dr. Friedoken. Thank you for inviting me to your luncheon meeting. Since this is a luncheon meeting, I trust you will forgive me if I eat as well. I was very pleased to be invited to speak to you today. I spent the most interesting 10 years of my career working closely with scientists and engineers on product development in the medical electronics and software arenas, and I think each of you has the opportunity to contribute greatly to the quality of life of people with disabilities. 
Yes, do you want to At Hewlett Packard Company, one of the Coder Company values was that products had to make a contribution to their users, to their field of endeavor, or to the communities in which they are used. I'll come back to this idea of contribution later. Slide 4. I am going to spend the next 45 minutes or so talking about myself. Biases I have noticed in the atrophic atherosclerosis, the impact of electronic communication, critical environments for testing, my needs, and your potential to contribute. If you think. So, um, you know, as we, we listen to Colin, some of the things that, and, and I actually will ask if. Um, some folks would tell me, what did you see going on there as an individual communicating? Um, anybody want to, oh, somebody was, sorry, Elizabeth, there's an echo going on, I didn't hear that. Um, anybody want to make comments on uh, how they were viewing Colin as he was communicating? Because every time I see this, and you can imagine I've seen it dozens and dozens of times, I'm still amazed at how communicative he was. Um, so anybody that would like to write something in the um, he was lecturing, mm -hmm. exactly, and so he was using, in, in order to get his points across, he was using, um, uh, absolutely, allowed him to participate more, he was using pragmatic skills, you notice how he was nodding his head, he was looking out to the audience, he was using gestures, he was using multiple technologies, if you heard right before we turned it off, um, that uh, it said slide four, and so he had this auditory reminder to change the slide. He was using a mouse. He was using um, he was using a mouse to change the slides. He was using his uh, electronic speech um, to to speak to us. He was just using a whole host of things. And what we need to keep in mind is is that Colin was an individual who uh, came to using AAC with language strong language skills that were intact. We do know that other individuals are going to have language skills that are not as intact or not intact at all, either because they never developed language skills or they lost that language skill through uh, something like an acquired brain injury, like a traumatic brain injury, a stroke, um, any other number of primary progressive aphasia. There's all kinds of things um, that are acquired that can limit an individual's language skills post um, acquiring that diagnosis. And then there are some individuals, and, and, and some of the folks you'll see in, in the videos, the adolescents today that I have um, video of, they are still developing language. And so that's really important for us to know. So how do people communicate? We all communicate. What you communicate as a 14-year-old is very different than what you communicate when you're a 24-year-old. And that is even different from what you're going to communicate when you're a 44-year-old. Um, but communication is central to human life, and we all communicate. And, and optimal communication is what we all strive for. It's what I strive for here in our presentation. So when we use AAC, I want to ask a question. So we're going to do a poll, just a real quick poll. The answer is going to be yes or no. Um, is communicating medical needs the primary goal of AAC? And if you would just click yes or no, do you believe that communicating medical needs is the primary goal of AAC? I didn't say it's the only goal, but the primary goal. So, so far, OK, we have about 20 people. Um, so there we go. So about right now, 85% of the people say no, communicating med medical needs are not the primary goal. And 15% say that yes, in fact, communicating medical needs is the primary goal. And I think one of the things to keep in mind is um, there are how many of us here in this discussion today, all of us come from a different perspective. And so um, that certainly is why we don't have 100% of, of yes or no. When we talk about the goals of AAC, I'm going to talk about them very um, generally, and then we'll get into some more specific things that talks about what we just did in our poll. So when you talk about AAC, well, no matter what your age is, all right, it could be temporary. So if somebody has had, say, an injury to the vocal folds, if somebody is intubated, um, they may need AAC strategies or techniques for you know an hour a day, a week, a month. Other people long-term means of communication, and for other folks, and we'll see some of this today as well, the AAC, the goal of the AAC uh, in their world, the AAC 
strategy is to facilitate the development or redevelopment of natural spoken communication. Um, those are kind of the major areas. Some additional goals are not just medical. And it used to be, for those of us that have been in the field for uh, more than two decades, that med speak is what we used to call it. And if you were going to get something through an insurance company, whether it's a private insurance company or a public insurance company, health insurance, it was med speak. That, that's all that counted. You needed to be able to talk to your doctor. But now we've widened the lens. Um, we understand that there are so many stakeholders involved. There are so many communication partners. And so the ability to communicate self-care needs, emotional status, you know, that you're happy about something, that you're um, frustrated by something, the um, ability to engage in social communicative interaction with familiar communication partners, such as friends and family, and that interaction could be maybe singing happy birthday over the telephone to your, your best friend or your grandson or, or whatever. Another goal of ACE is to carry out communicative interactions in the community. So with unfamiliar partners, whether that's at the playground, whether that's on uh, the athletic field, whether it's at the bank, whether it's you know at a restaurant, wherever it is, we need to be able to communicate. And that depends on who the individual is. The way that we attempt to, um, to make this process somewhat systematic is to use um, a selection process that we go through. And here on the screen, we talk about uh, kind of what the, that continuum looks like. And we'll go through different pieces of this continuum. But in, you have to know who the individual is. Um, we have to really know what the individual needs to, to um, be able to communicate them, the needs assessment. Um, so for example, if somebody is in the seventh grade, what they're writing or saying is very different from somebody who's in, um, say, graduate school or someone who is in their orientation period at their first job, or someone, you know, it, it depends on where the individual is in his or her life with regard to what their needs are. And so that assessment has to be redone um, often as um, environments change and needs change. Look at the individual strengths and limitations. And once again, if it's a stable um, situation that they're dealing with, those strengths and limitations may uh, remain stable. In some cases, individuals improve in certain areas, and, and in other situations, individuals uh, lose skills. And, and it is what it is. That's all there is to it. We're going to look at access methods. So as a person, um, like we saw with Colin, he was using direct selection. Uh, somebody else might be using eye gaze. Another person might be using a switch. Um, somebody else might be using Morse code. I mean, we have all kinds of ways that we can access technology. We want to do a feature match at some point, and that is looking at what features, not what features the technology has, but more importantly, what features of technology, the AAC, um, does the individual need? At that next point is to try and mock up what we think the individual needs and try it out. Then we can do a final system analysis with purchase and then follow up. This process, if you will, if you would imagine just a large table, a large empty table, and as we go through the systematic selection process and as we gain information anywhere in this process and anyone on the team that has something to, to provide, the individual, their caregivers, whoever else is on the team, a speech path, an occupational therapist, you know, a nurse, a social worker, you name it. Anybody can be on the team. Um, any information that is obtained during the selection process um, is kind of thrown on this proverbial table. And so this table is eventually going to be the puzzle that is the AC device. And all these little tidbits of information that we kind of throw on this table, we're going to eventually put it all together. The, the thing is, this puzzle didn't come in a box with a picture, so we don't know what we're putting together until the end. And that's based on everything we find throughout this systematic selection process. And I have to repeat, it has to be done time and again based on where a person is um, in their development and in their needs and that sort of thing. So we'll briefly go through some of these steps. And please, anybody else that has um, questions, please put them into the chat box and Russ, Russ will make sure that we get those addressed. You know, the initial interview is just basic demographic information, background information, interview the caregiver, observe the individual. There are all kinds of ways that we garner information. The needs assessment would be looking at 
what kind of partners the individual is communicating with. So, you know, a kid is in the seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade. Who are their communication partners? It's their parents and their siblings and their family, but it's also their peers. It's their educators. Um, is it individuals in the neighborhood and community? What environments are they going to be communicating in? Is it just at home? Is it just from bed? Is it on the school bus? Is it in the school? Is it in the cafeteria, on the playground? You know, what environments? Is it at work? Is it, you know, out, out at dinner? What kinds of messages need to be communicated? And so if you're in, um, in college, if you're in high school, college, graduate school, whatever, you, you can't be relying on simple sentences to communicate the, the sorts of things that you need to do in those environments. So what types of messages and what modes does an individual need in order to communicate? And part of that is, you know, you're going to do it face-to-face. -face. You're going to be doing it over FaceTime or Skype. You're going to be using online access. Are you going to be producing something written? Because written communication is as important as spoken communication when we talk about AAC, and particularly as a person goes through their um, life into adulthood. And so look at all of those needs. And once again, throw all this information onto this proverbial table that I will talk about. The next area is we really look at the strengths and limitations of the individual. That's, that's not a negative thing. None of us um, you know, have every, every strength known to me. And we all have our, our limitations. You know, I have no eye hand coordination. I have a whole host of, uh, of limitations. And we all have strengths and limitations. And we're going to look at those in four specific areas, cognition, language, motor skills, and sensory skills. Um, I generally just list them in alphabetical order in my report. That's just because how I am. It doesn't matter how you address these four areas. They just all have to be addressed. And so we will look at some examples of video. And I want you, each time we're looking at videos, to be thinking about this slide. What do you see going on cognitively? What kind of linguistic skills do you see going on? What's going on rhetorically? And what kinds of sensory things are going on, whether it's auditory, tactile, visual, whatever it may be. And all of this is really important <clears throat> in the process as we go through working with individuals and as their needs change. So here we go. You know, we start with what, what is the widget thing going to have on it? Is it going to have pictures on it? Is it going to have text on it? I, I don't care what the answer is. The answer is whatever the individual needs. So we're going to go to a video now, and we're going to look at an individual who, in the first video, um, is using icons. And let me tell you while we're setting up this video, I had just um, delivered this to Chip earlier in the day, about 2 or 3 in the afternoon, and this is a few hours later, and this is a video that his dad took. Chip, can you tell me time for dinner? Can you tell me time for dinner? Can you tell me time? Can you clear it? Can you tell me time? Can you clear it? Clear it. Clear it. Chip, tell me time for dinner. Chip, tell me time for dinner. <laughs> Chip, tell me. Chip, tell me. Can you say time for dinner? You say time there you go, dinner. good clear. There you go, good clear. Time for. Oh, for what? Oh, for what? Do it. Yeah! You like that? <laughs> Very nice. And so that is Chip using an icon-based system. So I'm going to go back one slide. And uh, if you look on the left-hand side, this is not the exact screen that Chip was working from, but, but that's the idea. Now we're going to go and see the second slide. And, and his dad will explain, his dad will set it up for us, exactly what is happening here. This is just five minutes later when I've added him into the alphabet page and asked him to tell me time for dinner by spelling it out. You ought to see how excited it was when he figured it out. You got it? You got it? Yeah, it did say time. Time. <laughs> yeah, it did say time. Time what? Time what? <laughs> 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 
when we look at those four areas that I showed um, a few minutes ago, we'll just briefly talk about those again with regard to the two videos that you just saw. And once again, feel free to enter any information into the chat room. So when we talk about cognitive linguistic skills with regard to Chip, his dad knows him inside and out. Chip was about 18 years, 19 years old at that time, maybe 20, 21. Um, and his dad knew that based on his level of cognition and language, that not only did he need validation, things like, yeah, she did say time. That was also providing some verbal prompting. Um, he did that in the first video. Time, time for, yeah, it did say time for. Time for what? Do it. And it says dinner. He goes, yeah, you like dinner. You know, that kind of stuff. The dad was prompting him. Motorically, you saw what was going on there, that he was able to isolate a finger and, and, and point to if there was a keyboard, you saw that was an old PDA um, architecture, personal digital assistant. Um, so you can imagine that the alphabet was on that. That's at least 26 characters and a, a period to make a talk or a speech case. So there was a lot going on there. And you saw that he was able to adjust from um, the pictures, icons with text, to text. And so um, at, with regard to sensory, auditory, visual, it was a small screen. He was able to, to work with that. He was able to hear what it said. He was able to hear what his dad was saying. It was loud enough so that his dad could hear what he was saying. All of those sorts of things are taken into consideration. Here's another example. Um, when you look at somebody's cognitive linguistic sensory and motor skills, this is an example of uh, picture word power from Nancy Inman, and I don't even know what device this is on. But um, you can see it's a system that uses a color coding. It uses um, words, but they all have icons on them. So we have icons with text. There's also a keyboard. Along with the keyboard, there's some word prediction. You see A, M, were. There, is a, there are a whole host of things going on here. And so in this case, you know, we've merged the two. We're using whole words as well as letters as well as word prediction. And different individuals utilize um, these different scenarios. And so we have to look at what's important for each person. The bottom line is that the in the big picture, as Daniel Webster said, um, it kind of sets this up really well here. He says, you know, if all of my possessions were taken from me with one exception, I would choose to keep the power of communication, for with it, I would soon regain all the rest. Um, Along those mindset, um, Ken has made the comment that the challenge still seems to be interactive communication um, at conversational speeds, which I'm guessing is where you're going anyway. So, it, yeah, and, and Ken, you're exactly right. Um, and and so Ken said, "Hey, that was a prepared speech, wasn't it?" Yes, it was a prepared speech, but he had the timing down. Um, I have been in meetings with Colin where he waited and then he made his his comments just the way all of us would in a, in a meeting, and then he was able to respond to any questions that were posed. And Ken is ahead of us on this. Ken is about 10, 15 slides, 20 slides ahead of us. We're talking about communicative competence, all right? And so that sometimes needs to be redeveloped, or sometimes you need to do that feature match with what technology can keep up with me so that I can remain conversational. Uh, in in um, Colin's case, he was using a keyboard um, with rate enhancement strategies such as abbreviation expansion and word prediction or word completion, you want to call it. So the, the good and the bad news is that um, it's not easy because we're all individual. And Don Johnston says it the best. He said, um, we're all individual. Our communication is our own fingerprint. So as specific as 
you know, your fingerprint is to use, so are your communication needs. Now, this is an unusual slide here, but I use this as my um, as my uh, access into this discussion. There is a book called The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, and I don't um, I don't know if anybody else has seen the book, the movie. Um, I haven't been able to really watch the movie the, the um, whole way through, but I read the book a bunch of times. This is by a gentleman who was an editor of a French magazine, the Elle magazine, and sustained um, a massive um, brainstem level stroke. And so he actually wrote this book, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, using spelling only. Now, interestingly enough, he chose for his communication technique not to use technology. He chose to use um, a letter board, and his communication partner, who happened to be his caregiver, would, would write everything down as he used his eyes to go to a, a letter board the caregiver would write everything down. That's exactly how they wrote this book. Um, but he talks about letters of the alphabet so so clearly. And as, as a writer, I guess it makes more sense that he can do it. So I'm going to use his words. He has a, a um, chapter in this book called The Alphabet. And, and these are his words. I am fond of my alphabet letters. At night, when it is a little too dark, and the only sign of life is a small red spot in the center of the TV screen, Vowels and consonants dance for me. He says, um, hand in hand, letters across the room, roll around the bed, sweep past the window, wriggle across the wall, swoop to the door, and return to begin again. And then he tells you, you see that line there, E-S-A-R-I-N-T-U-L-O-M-D-P-C-F-B, line two, V-H-G-J-Q-Z-Y-X-K-W. He says, the jungle appearance of my course line stems not from chance, but from cunning calculation. More than an alphabet, it is a hit parade in which each letter is placed according to its frequency of use in the French language. So I emphasize that because those of us that use English will look at that and say that is the most unusual configuration of letters. But as he said, he says this is why E dances proudly out in front, while W labors to hold on to the last page place, B resents being pushed back next to V, and haughty J, which begins so many sentences in French, is amazed to find itself so near the rear of the pack. Roly-poly G is annoyed to have to trade places with H, while T and U, the tender components of T, rejoice that they have not been separated. All this reshuffling has a purpose, to make it easier for those who wish to communicate with me. And that's the bottom line. And believe me, when he wrote this, he didn't know that a speech pathologist would be using it to discuss how we design um, augmentative communication uh, across the lifespan and, and just in general. But I think he says it so well. So we have so many different ways that we can lay things out on, on our screen or whatever it is that we're using. You saw um, icon-based. We saw uh, what that, that icon screen a few. Let me go back to that one because I want to look at this. This is something we don't look at all that often or we don't consider all that often. but. It is the alphabet arranged statistically from the center out. So this is on the um, on the left hand side. The um, keyboard that you see is statistically arranged from the center going out. And so you can see A E I L O. So certainly vowels are right there in the middle. The space bar is right there in the middle. It's double sized because the space comes after every word. And in English, the average word is five to six characters in length. And so you're going to have a space after every average five to six letters. You see letters like Z and X and Q and J are furthest away from the center. But the whole point here is if somebody is using um, a single point, whether it's a, a, a finger that's isolated, whether it's a head stick that folks use, whether it's using eye gaze, you can see that it, you hope to increase the rate by keeping the letters that you use most often closest to your pointing system, your finger, whatever it happens to be. And so that inherently increases the rate. You look at the layout of the um, picture word power. You can see it's color coded from the left to right. We have pronouns, preverbs, verbs. Um, then we have prepositions. We have other attributes. Um, all of that is laid out so that individuals can communicate optimally, and as Ken said, to be conversational in nature. Additional, and as um, Jean-Dominique um, Bobby says 
so that he can communicate and others can communicate with him. Here we have a T9 layout on the um, left-hand side, which you really can't use in our laptops and tablets anymore forever because uh, that technology is owned by the phone companies, but we've all used it on our cell phones. Um, and I didn't even have to back up that far. I forgot I had this keyboard right here. Once again, the example of the um, frequency of occurrence from the center out. And so, you know, the question is, what do we do? And what do we do for a 14-year-old versus what we do for a 40-year-old versus what we do for a 60-year-old? You know, it all depends, once again, on the individual. So I'm going to show, we're going to look at meet Norlon now. Norlon, at this time, was about 9 or 10 years of age. And um, we'll talk on the other side about Norlon, but I, I just want you to kind of watch the video. And, and on the other side, maybe put something in the chat, chat um, box about what you thought was going on there. That's right. The boy oh, is it buffering, do you think? In the okay. Bowl. Now let's record the sentence. Drag the correct preposition to the sentence. Drag the correct That's right. The cat is sitting on the car. Now let's record the sentence. It's all right. You can do it this way. It's all right. You can do it this way. The cat is sitting on the car. All right. Let's record. Let's record. The cat is sitting on the car. The cat is sitting on the car. Stop. Mm. The cat is sitting on the car. Sitting on the car. The cat is sitting on the car. So, I don't know if anybody else um, has some things to write in the in the chat box. When I think about the cognitive linguistic sensory and motor skills, um, I think we see a lot going on there. The purpose of this activity, this is actually therapeutic in nature. So you know, I said sometimes you use AAC short term, long term, or for the facilitation of um, natural speech. This was really for the facilitation of language development because um, at this point in time, Norlon had a vantage, which you see over to the right. He would never speak in complete sentences. He would. Um, always give me one word responses. And he was going into the fifth grade, and you've got to start using complete sentences. And so I was, he would do anything for an iPad. So I used apps on the iPad that were for the creation of complete sentences. And then he had to put that sentence into the um, Vantage, which would give him experience in creating complete sentences. And then he was all excited because he could choose the speech from the Vantage to record into the iPad and then have the iPad speak back what his answer should say. Um, and so he was incorporating mobile technology because of, that's what he needed at that time and age because those were cool to him. Um, his next technology, he took the software that is on that Vantage and got a mini um, iPad because he is so motivated to use iPads. And so all of that, when I talked about a needs assessment, you know, he had this Vantage and it worked, but because he was a, a 9 and 10 year old, he wanted iPad, he wanted tablet technology. And I think we're seeing that come forward. This is a statement from John Dewey in a document titled Democracy in Education, written in 1916. A society which is mobile, which is full of channels for the distribution of a change occurring anywhere, must see to it that its members are educated to personal initiative and adaptability. Otherwise, they'll be overwhelmed by the changes in which they're caught and whose significance or connections they do not perceive. We have to make sure that we are up to date, if you will, on what it is that individuals need or want for communication um, purposes. And I do think that we're seeing um, mobile technology take over um, AAC strategies. Uh, it's 
a whole host of reasons. It's much more affordable, um, somewhat intuitive because we're using it in so many environments. You go into um, you go into the Ryzen store and you type in your first name and and what you're there for, and it gets put up on the waiting list for the screen. There are so many other places where you um, check yourself out in the grocery. That's using a, a touch tablet. Um, those skills are transferable, very adaptable. Um, mobile technologies tend to be very simple, and they're very portable. They're very accessible. This happened to be from a group that were talking about mobile technologies and special education, and that group was um, a, uh, him, a PT and OT and a speech language from the Appleton, Appleton excuse me, area school district, and that was back in 2011, but I think it's really important as we talk about AAC across the environment. So um, you saw Norlon. Norlon was communicating in the therapy room. You saw Chip. Chip was communicating with his dad at the, at the kitchen table. Um, we, we're going to talk more about communication partners. I, I went forward um, a little bit too fast there. But we need to talk about communication partners. And so what I did is I reached out to some folks that have been using AAC for years and years and years and just asked them to give me some insight for this presentation. And I put one of those, the results from one of those um, individuals into this. India Oaks is a woman who works, um, this is from her Facebook page. She works um, at the US for the federal government. She studied law at Syracuse University, and she lives here in Annapolis, Maryland. Um, when I asked India, and this is a picture of India with Cal Ripken, as we are in Baltimore, and her uh, baby, Jack, at the time. She says, part of it really is who the person is. Either you have self-confidence, in her case she said that I have, or you don't. If you don't, you can learn to have success, but I don't think it's the same. I um, was also understanding people, which goes back to self-confidence. So she was really saying that we need to be empowered and confident. I knew early on that people only teased me because they lacked self-confidence. That doesn't mean I wasn't vulnerable, and she said I did get into a fight at the time. But she went on and said, and there's your little son, Jack. Um, she said, also, I always had older friends, including adults, and having adults respect you at any age makes a huge difference. So I asked questions, and most people respected me enough to answer. From the beginning, this is what I think the critical piece is. This is India, who is nonverbal. She says, from the beginning, I knew to play to my audience. And she said, um, and I think that helped me get the things I wanted, not only what you say to them, but how you communicate. So whatever was easiest for the other person, with how I talk to people. So what India is saying to us here is she was considering who her communication partners were. So when, when she communicated, was she communicating to um, someone at work? Was she communicating to a professor at law school or a peer? Was she communicating in the, the environment with Cal Rifkin? Was she communicating with, with her young son, Jack, or with his teachers? Um, and his after school program, she would always consider the communication partner. And that's so important when we talk about augmentative and alternative communication. And our communication partners change as we go through life. So the partner of a 15 year old is very different than the communication partner for a 50 year old. And so uh, Jeff Higginbottom, Higginbottom and Howard Chain and, and uh, Kevin Caves and, and others wrote that um, partners benefit from communication outcomes output that fits within their attention, their memory, their social interaction ability. So I'll give you a little scenario of India uh, communicating. As we are driving through downtown, not downtown, we're driving through DC, right? We've gone to lunch and we're driving through DC and India prefers to write a lot of her communications. She doesn't use um, technology all that often for speaking and so she writes. And she has an absolutely nasty, terrible, horrible handwriting. And she just scribbles so fast because she has so much to say. And uh, so I'm driving, and India is having a conversation with me. So we're, we're driving, and eventually it starts getting dark. And so now I'm having to look to my right in the passenger seat, try to read her scribble as I'm driving through Washington, D.C., and the sun is going down. I finally say to her, India, look, as your communication partner here, I can't read what you're writing, what you're scribbling when the sun is going down. So you know, she needed to take into consideration me, and what we were doing, I was driving while she was trying to read her, you know. So you've got to think of all kinds of scenarios, and each individual is different. Um, and so we have a variety of communication partners. We're going to talk about who some of those are. The group has grown consistently over the recent decades. Um, 
these parties are not only uh, family members and caregivers, um, there are a host of whole other individuals who are, are part um, our communication partners. And so some of the things we need to do um, are make sure, and, and I think Colin did that well, we saw, um, we saw um, Chip with his dad. His dad knew what he was saying. His dad knew ahead of time. But we, we have a lot of anecdotal information that says that um, we really have to have the communicationers, communication partners buy in, if you will, um, for initial and ongoing successful integration of the devices and techniques and strategies. And others remind us that every member of the family is influenced and or affected by the introduction of or the updating of a device into the life of a family member. So we have to consider the individual themselves as well as who their communication partners are. Um, and really recognize the uh, experience of families and individuals in the community as well as the needs of those um, stakeholders. So um, Sarah Blackstone and, um, and her colleagues wrote about the circle of communication partners. And essentially, those communication partners were um, life partners at the very center. Well, the very center is the individuals who are using the speech generating device or the IEC device. But we have life partners. We have close friends and relatives. As you move out, there are acquaintances, paid workers, and unfamiliar partners. And you know, there are fewer family members than they and or in close friends and relatives than there are workers and unfamiliar communication partners. And so that, those circles are large, and we have to learn to communicate in those environments. Um, and we do know that. Um, so research has shown us um, that that social as our social interactions increase, the um, degree of social inclusion. Um, expands so that individuals are not feeling a sense of isolation or loneliness because they have more and more opportunities to build ties and interaction. We do know that individuals with complex communication needs are at a high risk for having restricted social networks, and so we have to keep that whole social networking in consideration at various points in our life. We're going to look at a, speaking of communication partners, we're going to watch a, a brief video of Jean and who her communication partners are. And so um, it's just be a, about a minute or so, but I want you to know this all the different interactions here. That while you're queuing that up, Ken um, noted that writing recognition has come a long way in the last few years, perhaps talking about you know, your partner in the car. Um, right. And writing recognition might have made it so you didn't have to be looking at her and read. Exactly, Ken, that's a good point, as well as gestural recognition. Um, when we talk about individuals who have such significant motor um, disruptions, we're now finding, and the research is, is really getting better on gestural recognition. But you're also very right with written writing recognition of uh, text. Thank you so much. Nolan, are we going to queue up, Jane? Anybody? All right, Jean, you got you got your car. All right, Jean, you got, you got yeah. Your what are you going to do with your car? Yeah. What are you going to do with your Yes, absolutely. But have you, do you, have you practiced driving you yet? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Who's going to help but you have, practice driving? Have you practiced driving yet? Um, Becky. Yeah, anybody else? Who's going to help you practice driving? Um, Becky. Yeah, anybody else? Hey, you know, this was the wrong video. Not the right gene video. Right, there's one other gene video, and we're going to use this one a little bit later on. And I can certainly um, interact. Do you see the one that, that uh, was called ASHA 08? Oh, that's the one, okay. Yeah. So, um, everybody in the audience, just wait for one second. You're going to see a real difference between gene, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. The gene that you see in the video that, that no one is uh, pulling up right now. Go. I'm so proud, proud of you. you. I'm so proud of you. Good job. Good job. I'm so proud of you. Good job. Good job. Good job. How? How does work? I need to talk. I will know. I need to 
So as we looked at that video, we see that the communication partners that Jean um, needed to take into consideration were she was a mom, so she had two daughters, Carly and Caitlin. She was Steve's wife. She was Lois's friend. She had a lot of friends in the community. Um, we see in this first video, I mean this video that we just watched, the first one that we pulled up, I'm going to show you again a little bit later, you see how improved Jean's speech was. And that's what we're going to talk about, how she became more competent. Um, because right here, she's working on consonant vowel sounds. She's working on imitating a, an immediate model where she would, um, she would prompt herself using the device and then try to repeat it. What we were working towards with Jean and with Nolan, I mean Norlan and with um, Chip, was essentially communicative competence. And this was originally defined by Janice Light back in 1989 as an individual's ability to communicate, to communicate, excuse me, functionally with communication partners across the day and across all of their natural environments. And that's really important what's natural. A natural environment for me is very different than the natural environments for my sisters, which are very different than the natural environments for my neighbors, you know. So communicative competence is defined as um, linguistic competence or linguistic skills, operational skills or competence, social skills, competence, strategic skills and competence. So linguistic skills and competence, we saw a, um, we saw Jean and we saw some very limited linguistic skills. We saw India and the writing that she did and she has some very strong linguistic competence, and she's a very successful um, human rights attorney. She's also a past president of USAC, and she's done all kinds of things. Look at operational competence. We saw Chip, and he knew how to work the screen. He knew how to work it, whether there were icons on it, he, um, or whether there were letters on it, you know, how to turn the volume up, how to turn the device on and off, how to move. You saw uh, operational competence with Norlon when he was working two separate devices. He knew how to control not only Vantage, but the iPad. Social competence or social skills competence, I think we saw that with, um, with, with Colin. And strategic skills, strategic competence. Um, I give an example. Norman one day was leaving my office and his mother said, um, tell Pat where we're going when we leave and, and my office is down in downtown Baltimore. And he looks at her and then he gets a smile on his face and he starts running through his Vantage. And what he had done is he didn't, he, they were going sailing to the downtown sailing um, center. And he didn't know, he didn't have sailing in his vantage. So he went to, sail, he went to um, nouns, sailboat, and then he went to um, his backspace and took off B O A T. And then he added I N G from the screen. He was using uh, picture word power at the time. So he was able to say sailing because he strategically knew how to get to that word. He could have spelled it with word prediction. There's all kinds of things he could have done. He could have done. So when we talk about breaking out these, we'll run through these, um, but essentially what are the receptive and expressive language skills of the individual in their native language, but not only of the individual, of 
his or her communication partners. Um, and, and that competence is the ability to learn to, and use symbols or letters or words or drawings, whatever it is, so that they can, an individual can communicate meaning. Our linguistic skills or competence um, are an individual's ability to learn and become proficient in the language of the AAC, if you will, whether it's picture word power or whether it's an other icon set or whether it's it's a keyboard, a statistically arranged keyboard versus a QWERTY keyboard versus an ABC keyboard. And these operational, I'm sorry, I said these operational skills are important um, for electronic and non-electronic devices, and we have to keep that in mind. Um, social skills refers to the pragmatic aspects of communication, which are critical in all forms of communication. So we saw Norlon when he he wanted what he wanted to do is he wanted to change up the order in which he did things. And so he puts his finger up and he turns around and he laughs and he smiles and laughs because he was like saying to me, I know I didn't do it the way that we normally do it and I just need to give him some validation. Yeah, it's okay. You can do it this way. And so those are some social skills that he incorporated into, um, into that communication that we had, which happened to be in a therapeutic environment. Um, strategic skills, those compensatory techniques or strategies that are employed by an individual to, I say, guarantee effective communication interactions. I don't know that we can ever guarantee anything. Um, but some of these strategies may include mechanisms to introduce a communication partner to an AAC strategy or to avoid or repair a communication breakdown. There are all kinds of strategic um, competencies that we need to include. And some of these need to come through therapy. So an individual gets the widget, the communication device, depending on what their needs are um, and what their skill set is, we, we need to, to work with that individual. And so very often we're going to have to also do some AAC treatment or, or therapy. But I want to ask now, I want to do a poll question and ask those of us that are here today, um, which is the most important environment to practice and use your skills of communicative competence? Would you say it's in the therapy setting, it's in the home, or it's in the community? And if we could pull up that poll, and a handful of us can can um, respond to that. Okay, so we have the poll right there underneath the slide. So which is the most important good environment to practice and use skills of communicative competence? Therapy setting, home, community. Yeah, this is perfect. All right. Now, I want everyone to look at that poll. And if you would do a mirror image of it, right, and then look at the next slide, because you guys hit the nail on the head. So when we talk about social validation, therapy is at the top with the least, and that's what you all said. In the home is more. But out in the community is where you really develop and um, increase, develop, really use your, your competencies to communicate. So you, you guys really did hit that nail on the head. So I'm going to use Jean as an example of this whole social validation, although I did say that when, when Schiff was just talking with his dad, his dad that was in the home, but his dad was doing a whole lot of really good stuff with him, his dad was, um, like I said to him, Chip said, oh, excuse me, Chip said, uh, time for, and his dad said, time for, time for what? You know, he said, um, come on, Chip, do it. And then Chip says, dinner. He goes, yeah, we like dinner. And, and the next time when he was doing it with the um, keyboard, he said, um, yeah, it did say time after, after Chip had, had typed out T-I-M-E. And so this whole concept of validations from others are how we develop our skills. It's how all of us developed our skills when, um, whenever we started developing speech and language. So I'm going to use the case study of Jean in our last couple minutes that we have here. And you saw Jean um, talking with her daughter and with Steve, her husband, and with Lovelace, her friend. And then about a year later, after therapy, we started noticing some things. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but whenever she, she would... Uh, block or, or not be able to say a word with her husband, he would give her a linguistic prompt where he would say the initial sound or a phonemic prompt. We were noticing that they were fading, that Jean started to spontaneously produce one to four word questions and comments with her own natural speech. And some examples that Steve gave me were dinner, like when he came home, she would say dinner, like do you want dinner now? Uh, she would say, 
what now? I asked her a question, what did, who went out to dinner on um, the other night? She said, me, Carly, and Steve. And then who knows what question she was answering. Uh, she said, yes, he wears it. So those are examples where she had a communication device in addition to the electronic communication device. She also used writing um, on paper. And she also spelled things out in the air um, on occasion. All of this was helping to develop her natural speech. Um, then a few months later, Steve reported that Jean was using 60 plus words um, for items around the house. And that friends would take her to the grocery store and expect her to order items. In fact, we did that as a, um, a uh, homework, if you will, from therapy. I said, you know, when you guys go to the grocery store, Steve, this week, make Jean say everything that she's putting in the cart. And they came back the next week and they were like, well, we didn't get very many groceries that first time. But, you know, she started doing those things. He reported that while they were driving, Jean would say stop, left, right. And so she was really interacting in and playing her role as the wife while they were driving, while she was a friend. And then we continued on and we got more data. And we looked at Jean um, in May of, of 2009, where she was independently saying things 20% of the time. She was using her device 40% of the time. And she was relying on phonemic cues from her communication partners 40% of the time. And then 11 months later, she was communicating independently 67% of the time. She was using her device to prompt her 23% of the time, and she was no longer relying on phonemic cues. Um, and the way we got some of this data, she was using picture cards with open-ended questions at home and was only requiring minimal prompting. And so now we, were, we will look at the video of Jean, and I want you to look at her communicative competence and how she's learned to use her device across communication partners, um, across environments. And so we can, um, this is going to be a little different than the first slide uh, video. All right, Jean, you got, you got your car. Car. Yeah. What are you going to do with your car? Yes, absolutely. But have you, do you, have yes, you practiced absolutely. driving yet? But have you, do you, have you practiced and who is going to help yet? you practice driving? Yeah. Who is going to help you practice driving? Becky. Yeah, anybody else? Yeah, you know um, what? Watch this. Your, got it started. Your it husband. Steve. Very good. Vicky and Steve are going to help you drive. Very what good. kind of car did you get? You drive. What kind of car did you um, get? Do you remember? Mazda. Mazda. Did you get the Mazda 3 or the Mazda 6? 6. Very cool. What color is the car? Did you get the Mazda 3 or the Mazda 6? There, cool. What color is the car? You can do this. We practice this with colors of shirts. What color is your shirt? Is it orange? No. Blue? No. Red. Ah, red. very good. You got a red Mazda 6. <laughs> very good. Is it um, She's looking for manual or automatic here. transmission? Yeah. Which one? It's not manual. No. It's automatic. Yeah. Oh, Can you say so automatic? Very good. Beautiful. Yeah. Very good. So where do you want to drive in your new car? Drive. Yeah. Where? I don't know. Da, da, da. Yeah. Do you want to have the radio on? Yes. Yeah. Singing. Yes. Yes. You're gonna go spend money. Where? And so you know, I'm, I'm prompting her with a model. So where do you want to drive in your new car? Mm -hmm. Yeah, where? At the mall. Oh, very good. Are you going to shop or eat at the mall? She's using gestures, smiling. Very good. <laughs> and? <laughs> and um, where? OK. So we can stop that video here, not only just because we're running out of time. Um, but I hope that this last video illustrated that Jean was using a variety of strategies so that she communicated not only with her friend Lois, her husband Steve was sitting to her right out of the, um, out of the field of vision. Um, I was in the room. We were really just having a conversation, uh, four adults having a conversation. But she also um, had to be with Carly when she was cheerleading. She was, as I said, with friends in the, in the community. That was a very different. This was an acquired disability. Um, in her mid-40s. And um, you, you can see that it, it took a while to 
get her communicative, whether it was using a combination of her device with writing, with gestures, um, and some natural speech skills. And so each person is different. There's no question that's what the word individual means. We have to consider only the individual. Um, not, not only, but we have to primarily consider the individual and their communication partners and their needs um, when we're looking at strategies. And as I said in that process, then we do follow up because, you know, when, when you're communicating as, as I said, a 17-year-old, that's not like communicating like a 35-year-old. And so we have to constantly keep this up. I um, really want to thank everybody for, for coming to this session this afternoon. I appreciate uh, the interactiveness. I appreciate the comments. I appreciate that you did the polls and, and did it so well. Anyone can feel free to contact me um, via email, which is up here on the screen, or um, call my cell if you want. I always have it on. Um, and uh, have a nice day. Thank you so much. Thanks, Russ, uh, for the opportunity. So, Pat, you have just a couple of comments that I guess uh, corroborate what you were what you were just stating the need to practice in every setting in which the individual is going to use the AAC and Perfect. that it's going to depend completely on various clients' needs. Isn't that wonderful? You guys get it. Yeah. That's all exactly right. That's that's great. Well, thanks. Okay, for just, to note, just to note, Anna Maria has put a link in the chat box. We'd really appreciate it if you take the time to go to that survey and just let us know. Uh, whether this webinar met your needs or how we might improve them in the future. Um, we take that those comments real seriously because we're always trying to uh, to do better and to make things more relevant to the folks that are that are participating. So I'll add my thanks to, to Pat for you to you all for coming and uh, to you Pat, thanks an awful lot for putting this together and sharing it with us today. Absolutely. All right everybody have a great day.